It is good to see everyone here tonight. It is good to uh, have our visitors. We're glad that you're with us. And we hope that if <clears throat> you have any question, you'll feel free to ask us anything concerning the work of the church here at Roy City. We're striving to be a church of the New Testament. We're trying to the best of our ability to follow the Bible, God's holy word. And as a result of that, we understand and realize that we are human. That the church is composed of people, and those people make mistakes. Those people need adjustments in the Word of God. That's the purpose of us assembling together, not only to remember the Lord's death upon the first day of the week, but also to receive exhortation, instruction in the Word of God. And so this sermon tonight is a sermon that I'm going to preach, and I want us to take a self-evaluation of ourselves as a congregation and as individual Christians. This is the best congregation that I have ever worked with. But even the best congregation, from time to time, needs rebuke. Even the best of us, myself included, we need rebuke and instruction from time to time. And the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. So the Holy Spirit through Paul is telling us that we are to test ourselves. We are to examine ourselves. And we are to see where we may fall short with the responsibility with the purpose of correcting that. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 tells us the things written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Having that in mind, I want you to turn to the book of Haggai. The book of Haggai in the Old Testament. In the book of Haggai, you have the people, they have returned back to the land. They had strong leadership, which exhorted them to rebuild the walls and to rebuild the temple of the Lord. But they became complacent. You read in Ezra chapter 4 and chapter 5 that they had received persecution and pressure from their enemies and the work of the temple stopped. The temple foundation was built, but then they stopped. And God called Haggai to stir them up. To stir them up and to get them to examine themselves in the light of God's will. Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1, In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying... So this is to the governor of Judah, Zerubbabel, and to Joshua, the high priest. Verse 2. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. For 16 years, they were neglecting the building of the temple. They put it on hold. And the people's attitude was, it's not time. It's not time to build the Lord's house. Verse 3, Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, verse 4, Is it time for you yourself to dwell in paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? 
Is it time for you to go to your paneled houses? And that is referring to houses that have been built for luxurious living. And what he's saying, is it time for you to spend money on yourself while the temple of the Lord lies in ruins? To have paneled houses back then meant a lot of work was put into it. A lot of work was put into those paneled houses. That meant a house of luxury. And God's temple lies in ruins. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, verse 5, Consider your ways. That's the title of my sermon tonight. Consider your ways. Self-examination. Consider your ways. Verse 6. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And each one earns wages and earns wages to put them into a bag with holes. The point of this verse here in verse 6 is saying... Your focus is on the material, but that is something that does not last. It does not last. It's only for the here and now. And then he says in verse 7, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain, bring wood, build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Think about this in relationship to the spiritual temple. The spiritual temple which the Bible speaks of in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 2, which is the church of the Lord. The spiritual temple of the Lord. Think about this when it comes to the neglect that has been a trend in this congregation. The financial neglect that has been a trend in this congregation for a while in the Lord's house while we go home to paneled houses. The temple of the Lord is lying in ruins and we go home to paneled houses. This sermon is for me and my family and for everyone here. For us to examine ourselves in the light of this and to consider God's will concerning this. And God is saying, go up and you build this temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. God is glorified in the temple. The church is the temple, not this structure that we're in. This isn't the temple. The people are the temple. And God is glorified in the temple where he dwells. Verse 9 says, You look for much, but indeed it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, thus says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. My house is in ruins. Will you run to your own house? And he stirred up the people. Look at verse 12. That message stirred up the people. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Joshua, the, high, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. They feared God's word. They feared his presence. His heart was stirred up, as we're going to see a little bit later on in this passage. They obeyed the voice of the Lord through the prophet. Verse 13, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke, to the Lord's, uh, spoke the Lord's message to the people saying, verse 13, I am with you, says the Lord God. He was with them when they obeyed His will. I am with you. Verse 14, so the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judea, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord, their God. And it gives the time frame there, verse 15. On the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. 
Then you go into chapter 2, and verse 1, it says, In the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatiel, and the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory, and how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is it not in your eyes as nothing? Talking about the, the glory of Solomon's temple is not as great as the glory of the temple that Zerubbabel had built. But here's the point. They accomplished in a short period of time what they neglected for 16 years. They got busy. And they stopped neglecting the temple of the Lord. Brethren, we need to do a priority check on, on, our, on our giving and on our dedication along with our giving. And, and I say this with all kindness and love. As I said, this is the best congregation I've ever worked with. But if, if this trend here that I've seen so many times continues, we are going to deplete all of our savings and all of our checking. And we're going to have to stop supporting Mike Demery, Johnny Robertson, and the other good works that we do because we're spending more than we're taking in. This church is dedicated to doing the work of the church. What is the work of the church? Think of the word B, the acronym. Benevolence, evangelism, edification. This church is dedicated to doing those things. And we spend a lot of money in doing those things. Helping those who are in need and spreading the gospel. Helping those who preach the gospel. We are good at doing that, but we're running out of money to do it. That's just a simple fact of the matter. The temple of the Lord is being neglected and we go home to our paneled houses. We need to consider our ways. We need to look at ourselves in, in light of our relationship to this congregation. And is there not a loyalty to your home congregation? If you're a member of this congregation, should there not be a sense of loyalty? This is your family. This is your home congregation. If me and my family go out of town and we visit another congregation upon a Sunday, I'm not going to give to them what I had purposed to give here. And neglect the temple here in Roy City. Especially when we're struggling. The next Sunday when I come back, I'm going to double my contribution. That's not mine to keep to spend. I'm going to double it. Because that's what I purpose in my heart to give to the Lord. There is a sense of loyalty in our giving at the, our, at the congregation that we're a member of. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. As he's writing to the local congregation there at Corinth concerning the collection. And notice what he says here. 1 Corinthians 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week. Let each one of you lay something aside, storing up, as he may prosper, that there will be no collections when I come. This is authority for us to have a treasury, a pool of money by which the local congregation can fund its work. I mean, let's face it, it takes money for us to function and carry out the Lord's will. And that's based upon free will offerings. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 in relation to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Chapters 8 and 9 are great chapters. We're not going to go through all of them, but when you read and study 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, principles here of giving and giving sacrificially, giving liberally to the cause of Christ, even if you're in deep poverty. Because the example that he gives us is of brethren who are in deep poverty. Showing them to be liberal givers to the cause of Christ. 
2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. He says in verse 2, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Notice what Paul said here. He says, I want to talk now about the churches of Christ that are in Macedonia. Here's an example of great givers. He says in verse 2, Because out of a great trial of affliction and abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches, richness or the riches of their liberality. They were liberal givers even though they were in deep poverty. Verse 3 says, For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Notice that. According to their ability and beyond their ability. They went that extra mile. They gave. Imploring us the much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. Here's the key. Here is why they gave in such a manner. Verse 5. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord, then to us by the will of God. They gave themselves to the Lord. That's why they were such liberal givers. They gave sacrificially because they offered themselves as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Now, please understand, I'm not preaching this sermon so I can get a raise. I hadn't had a raise in years. I don't even get a cost of living raise. I'm not doing it for that reason. I would hate for us, by the end of this year, to start cutting out the good works that we're doing because we've depleted all our funds. We need to consider our ways. Because if this trend continues, that's exactly what's going to happen. We are spending abundantly on the spread of the gospel. We're spending abundantly helping those who are in need. We did have to pay for some necessity of our building as far as maintenance is concerned. A big chunk of money. But our giving has not been sacrificial. Our giving has waned. In the past few months. We need to really examine ourselves In the light of God's word. Concerning this. Look at chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. Paul says this I say. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. But let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly or of necessity. Before God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, He has dispersed abroad, He has given to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Look at verse 10. Now may He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. While you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. You see what he's saying there in verse 11? They were liberal in their giving. That caused thanksgiving to be given to God. More glory is given to God because they were able to help those who were in need. That caused more glory to be given to God. Verse 12, for the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgiving to God. Verse 13, while through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for, your, for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing. Notice the word liberality and liberal. Talking about their giving. That's where we should be liberal, not in doctrine, not in practice, but in giving. Liberal givers. 
sharing with them and with all men, and that by their prayer for you, who long for you you because of the exceeding grace of God in you, verse 15, thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. You see, the motivation for sacrificial giving is God's sacrificial giving. Let's examine ourselves in the light